Welcome to the podcast series The New Student Pharmacist, where we discuss chemistry and pharmacy, as well as leaders in pharmacy careers, community, and chemistry and pharmacy research. We encourage you to support the work we are doing and follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts by subscribing for free. Note, the views on the podcast represent those of my guest and I. Purpose of these episodes not at all, for advice or medical suggestions. These are aimed to provide support to peer pharmacists in training in educational and intellectually stimulating ways. Again, these are not at all for medical advice or medical suggestions. Please see your local board and state certified health professional. The views of this podcast represent those of my guests and I. CRISPR Ca9 Title Understanding CRISPR and CAS9 A Caribbean Academic Symposium Act 1 Introduction to CRISPR and CAS9 Scene 1 At a Caribbean University Symposium Hall Underscore Professor Williams Jamaican Molecular Biologist Underscore Welcome Esteemed Colleagues and Students To our Symposium on CRISPR and CAS9 Today, we'll explore this revolutionary technology that's reshaping our understanding of genetics. Underscore Professor Ramirez, Puerto Rican geneticist underscore indeed, Professor Williams. CRISPR, or clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, is a natural system found in bacteria. It's like their immune system, allowing them to recognize and cut out specific DNA sequences. Underscore Professor Jean Baptiste, Haitian biochemist underscore and CAS9, my friends, is the enzyme that acts as molecular scissors. It cuts the DNA at a specific location, allowing us to edit genes with unprecedented precision. Scene 2, a detailed explanation of CRISPR and CAS9 underscore Professor Williams underscore let's delve deeper. CRISPR sequences were first observed in bacterial genomes. These sequences are derived from DNA fragments of viruses that had previously infected the bacteria. Underscore Professor Ramirez underscore when these bacteria encounter the virus again, the CRISPR system can cut the viral DNA, preventing infection. This process is guided by RNA molecules that match the viral DNA sequence. Underscore Professor Jean Baptiste underscore in the lab, we can engineer these RNA molecules to target any DNA sequence. By attaching CAS9 to these RNA guides, we can target and edit specific genes in other organisms, not just bacteria. Act 2, Key Ideas and Applications Scene 1, Applications in Medicine underscore Professor Williams underscore One of the most exciting applications of crispr Con 9 is in medicine. Gene editing can potentially cure genetic diseases by correcting faulty genes in human cells. Underscore Professor Ramirez underscore take sickle cell disease, prevalent in many Caribbean communities. With CRISPR, we could correct the mutation in the hemoglobin gene, offering a permanent cure. Scene 2, Ethical and Ecological Considerations underscore Professor Jean Baptiste underscore but with great power comes great responsibility. Ethical concerns arise, especially with the potential for designer babies and unintended ecological impacts. Underscore Professor Williams underscore absolutely. It's imperative that we navigate these waters carefully, respecting ethical boundaries and prioritizing safety in our research. Scene 3, Future Directions underscore Professor Ramirez underscore CRISPR technology is still in its infancy. We're just beginning to understand its full potential and limitations. Continued research, especially in the Caribbean, where genetic diversity is vast, is crucial. Underscore Professor Jean Baptiste underscore indeed. Our region's unique biodiversity offers a rich ground for CRISPR research, not just in medicine, but in agriculture and environmental conservation as well. Act 3, Conclusion and Reflection Scene 1. Final thoughts underscore Professor Williams underscore today's symposium has shed light on the fundamentals, key ideas, and applications of CRISPR and CAS9. This technology isn't just a scientific breakthrough, it's a beacon of hope for future generations. 
underscore Professor Ramirez underscore let's continue our collaboration and research, ensuring that the Caribbean plays a vital role in the global conversation on gene editing. Underscore Professor Jean Baptiste underscore together, we can harness this technology for the betterment of humanity while preserving the ethical and moral values that guide our scientific endeavors. Underscore all professors together underscore thank you for joining us today. Let's pave the way for a brighter, healthier future with CRISPR and CONIN. The symposium ends with a round of applause, as attendees ponder the profound impact of crispr conine technology. In the realm of genes, a revolution unfolds, crispr conine a tale of science bold. A tool so precise, so cleverly designed, altering DNA, with accuracy refined. CRISPR, the sentinel, in bacteria born, a defense mechanism, from ancient times worn. Guided by RNA, CAS9 at its side, together they travel, through the genome they glide. CAS9, the scissor, with precision it cleaves, cutting the strands where it firmly believes. A guide RNA, its partner, shows the way, to the gene of interest, where it shall lay. Applications vast, in this molecular dance, from curing diseases to enhancing plants. Editing genes, with a future so bright, bringing new hope, in medical fight. Cancer, sickle cell, to these it attends, with crispr conine, the old order bends. In agriculture too, a revolution seen, creating crops resilient, and more so green. But with great power comes responsibility, ethical quandaries, and feasibility. A tool not just scientific, but of moral weight, in the hands of humanity, it shapes our fate. So here stands CRISPR, in the annals of time, a discovery profound, almost sublime. Unlocking life's code, with a key so small, holding the potential, to change life for all. Title, CRISPR Conine, the genome sculptor verse 1, yo, we talkin' bout a revolution in the lab, CRISPR Conine, cutting DNA, so fab. A genetic scissor, precise and clean, changing the scene of the human gene. It's like text editing, but for our cells, finding genes, casting molecular spells. CAS9, the enzyme, guided with grace, by RNA, finding that specific place. Chorus, CRISPR conine, rewriting the code of life, cutting through genes, like a surgical knife. With precision and care, it edits and fixes, opening doors, a future it predicts. Verse 2, from bacteria's defense, a tool so profound, in genetic realms, it's breaking new ground. Targeting genes, creating deletions or insertions, a new era of medicine, fueling our ambitions. Treating diseases, from cancer to sickle cell, a powerful tool, breaking the illness spell. Genetic disorders, now in our sight, CRISPR conine, shining a new light. Chorus, CRISPR conine, a revolution so bright, in the genetic night, it's a guiding light. Cutting and pasting, with molecular might, in the book of life, it's rewriting with insight. Bridge, but with great power, comes responsibility, ethical debates, in scientific communities. We must tread carefully, with this tool in hand, for the future of humanity, we must take a stand. Verse 3, agriculture transformed, crops with new traits, resistant to pests, high yields on our plates. Bioengineering, with new dimensions, crispr conine, fueling inventions. Chorus, crispr conine, a beacon of hope, in life's molecular scope, it helps us cope. A future so bright, with possibilities wide, in crispr conine, we take pride. Outro, so here's to the scientists, in their lab coats, with crispr conine, writing genetic notes. A tool so mighty, in a microscopic world, in the dance of DNA, its power unfurled. Intro, crispr conine, the genetic revolution yo, listen up, as we dive into the gene scene, crispr conine, a molecular machine. Changing the game in genetics, so pristine, 
an edit here, a snip there, oh so keen. Verse 1, The Discovery in the Depths of Bacterial Immunity, A Story Untold, CRISPR Arrays, Sequences Bold. CAS9, The Scissor, Precise and Cold, Chopping Viruses, A Sight to Behold. Verse 2, The Mechanism Guide RNA Leads, A Navigator So Bright, To the DNA Sequence, In the Genome's Night. CAS9 follows, with cutting mite, snipping genes, with accuracy type. Chorus, the power of CRISPR CRISPR K9, oh, what a sight, editing genes, with power, and life. A tool so sharp, it's changing the fight, in disease, in health, it's proving its might. Verse 3, applications in medicine from cancer to sickle cell, a hope on the rise, genetic disorders, we now can revise. CRISPR's precision, a gift we prize, a future of cures, right before our eyes. Verse 4, ethical considerations but with great power, comes a debate, ethics in question, we must contemplate. Designer babies, are they our fate? CRISPR's potential, we must navigate. Bridge, the future of genetics a world of possibilities, now in our hand. CRISPR K9, oh so grand. Revolutionizing science, across the land, in genetics, a new era, we stand out row, embracing the revolution so here's to CRISPR, a tool so fine, in the book of life, it's our new line. A future bright, with a design, CRISPR K9, the star that will shine. CRISPR K9 title, understanding CRISPR and CAS9, a Caribbean Academic Symposium Act 1, Introduction to CRISPR and CAS9 Scene 1, at a Caribbean University Symposium Hall underscore Professor Williams, Jamaican Molecular Biologist underscore Welcome, esteemed colleagues and students, to our Symposium on CRISPR and CAS9. Today, we'll explore this revolutionary technology that's reshaping our understanding of genetics. Underscore Professor Ramirez, Puerto Rican geneticist underscore indeed, Professor Williams. CRISPR, or clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, is a natural system found in bacteria. It's like their immune system, allowing them to recognize and cut out specific DNA sequences. Underscore Professor Jean Baptiste, Haitian biochemist underscore and CAS9, my friends, is the enzyme that acts as molecular scissors. It cuts the DNA at a specific location, allowing us to edit genes with unprecedented precision. Scene 2, a detailed explanation of CRISPR and CAS9 underscore Professor Williams underscore let's delve deeper. CRISPR sequences were first observed in bacterial genomes. These sequences are derived from DNA fragments of viruses that had previously infected the bacteria. Underscore Professor Ramirez underscore when these bacteria encounter the virus again, the CRISPR system can cut the viral DNA, preventing infection. This process is guided by RNA molecules that match the viral DNA sequence. Underscore Professor Jean Baptiste underscore in the lab, we can engineer these RNA molecules to target any DNA sequence. By attaching CAS9 to these RNA guides, we can target and edit specific genes in other organisms, not just bacteria. Act 2, Key Ideas and Applications Scene 1, Applications in Medicine underscore Professor Williams underscore One of the most exciting applications of CRISPR-K9 is in medicine. Gene editing can potentially cure genetic diseases by correcting faulty genes in human cells. Underscore Professor Ramirez underscore Take Sickle Cell Disease, prevalent in many Caribbean communities. With CRISPR, we could correct the mutation in the hemoglobin gene, offering a permanent cure. Scene 2, Ethical and Ecological Considerations underscore Professor Jean Baptiste underscore but with great power comes great responsibility. Ethical concerns arise, especially with the potential for designer babies and unintended ecological impacts. Underscore Professor Williams underscore absolutely. It's imperative that we navigate these waters carefully, respecting ethical boundaries and prioritizing safety in our research. 
Scene 3. Future Directions underscore Professor Ramirez underscore CRISPR technology is still in its infancy. We're just beginning to understand its full potential and limitations. Continued research, especially in the Caribbean, where genetic diversity is vast, is crucial. Underscore Professor Jean Baptiste underscore Indeed. Our region's unique biodiversity offers a rich ground for CRISPR research, not just in medicine, but in agriculture and environmental conservation as well. Act 3, Conclusion and Reflection Scene 1. Final thoughts underscore Professor Williams underscore today's symposium has shed light on the fundamentals, key ideas, and applications of CRISPR and CAS9. This technology isn't just a scientific breakthrough, it's a beacon of hope for future generations. Underscore Professor Ramirez underscore let's continue our collaboration and research, ensuring that the Caribbean plays a vital role in the global conversation on gene editing. Underscore Professor Jean Baptiste underscore together, we can harness this technology for the betterment of humanity while preserving the ethical and moral values that guide our scientific endeavors. Underscore all professors together underscore thank you for joining us today. Let's pave the way for a brighter, healthier future with CRISPR and CONI. The symposium ends with a round of applause, as attendees ponder the profound impact of crispr CONI technology. Welcome to the New Chemist Podcast. We're so glad you're listening. Feel free to download this podcast on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. Here on the New Chemist, we discuss chemistry, which simply put is the science of change, as well as careers, community research, and COVID-19. We're happy you're tuning in. My guest today is someone from the past, so we're going to be looking at the past work of Dr. Paul Boyer, the Nobel Prize Laureate in Chemistry in the year 1997. So the rationale for this, it is possible to start the journey to understanding the great feats and triumphs of scientists in the past and present. Be determined and consistent, keep at it, be hopeful, unrealistic, persevere. So this is a continuation of the Think Tank series. Um, we're looking, we'll be looking at different speeches of Nobel Prize laureates in chemistry and other places as well, other areas as well, rather. And the analysis for today is Paul Boyer's Nobel Prize lecture. That's a text we're going to analyze. So for the video, for those who will see the video that will be uh, corresponding with this audio version in the podcast, as a picture of Paul Boyer receiving his Nobel Prize. Before Paul Boyer received his Nobel Prize, there was a speech by Professor Bertel Anderson of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. The speech was given and he gave the story in a brief summary of the rationale for the Nobel Prize in chemistry. So fast facts about Dr. Paul Boyer. He lost his mother just weeks after his 15th birthday. He noted how he went to um, Brigham Young University, then to University of Wisconsin-Madison for graduate school. He received several awards and won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. It's important to note that he also read the Book of Knowledge, which is an encyclopedia aimed at juveniles, first published in 1912 by the Groyler Society. And he also read the Harvard Classics, which is a very interesting book series that I'm going to embark on reading. The Harvard Classics, uh, originally known as Dr. Eliot's Five Foot Shelf, is a 51 volume anthology of classic works from world literature, compiled and edited by Harvard University's president, Charles W. Eliot, and first published in 1909. A short list of some of volume one, just volume one, the other volumes within the Harvard classic series involve works by Benjamin Franklin, John Woolman, William Penn, so the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, the journal of John Woolman, Fruits of Solitude by William Penn, it also involves other, other seminal works, such as the Confessions by St. Augustine and The Wealth of Nations by Am Smith. Definitely a series worth reading. Um, now, this is how I would analyze a Nobel Prize laureate speech after the second time or third time reading it. And this is my perspective as a graduate student in chemical biology. 
So before we start, let's just keep in mind it's possible. It's possible to read these things and to try and understand them with guidance and some research. So just a preamble on ATP synthase. So in order to understand ATP synthase, we need to understand that like ATP synthase is a part of the electron transport chain. Um, the electron transport chain is organized in a particular way. It's established now that the electron transport chain is organized in which you have a respirosome super complex, which consists of complex one, three, and four. Um, it goes from one to three or two to three in terms of the flow of uh, electrons um, throughout the complex. But in, without getting into the nitty gritty details, let's just focus on ATP synthase, which is complex five. And it's a complex of the ETC, as I said. ATP synthase is significant since it facilitates the production of ATP. Now, an overarching trend that goes along with the chemiasmatic hypothesis, which, is, which coincides with Mitchell's idea, who was a 1978 Nobel Prize laureate in chemistry, the exogonic flow of electrons fuels the endogonic pumping of protons. So some big ideas to keep in mind. Um, within this work or this lecture, he discusses that the enzyme uses a novel mechanism that has catalytic steps different from any that has been seen before with other enzymes. ATP synthase has three copies of a large alpha and beta subunit with three catalytic sites located mostly on the beta subunit at the interface of the alpha and beta subunits. So these are subunits of this enzyme complex. So remember, we're talking about high level structure, not really linear or, or primary or secondary structure, we're talking about higher level structure. And it's also important to keep in mind that oxidative phosphorylation, um, it's an oxidative process, of course, it is biochemically significant because it produces a substantial amount of ATP. ATP is important since it's a common energy currency in the human body that in many cases is coupled to thermodynamically unfavorable processes so that they can work or run more efficiently. So in this talk, we will talk about why should we care, what the three points that stand out to me as a chemi chemical biology graduate student, and what are the implications. So let's begin. Um, so let's narrow in, narrow in some more. We're looking at the mitochondria, which is a very significant organelle. We could talk about the mitochondria in terms of distribution, in which you have heteroplasmy or homoplasmy, in which you have different distributions or same distributions of DNA. Homoplasmy, same, hetero, different. Um, we could also talk about the mitochondria and its intricacies in which you have significant phospholipids that make up the inner membrane, such as cardiolipid. We could talk about the mitoribosomes. We could talk about the crystalline membrane. We could talk about the power of the mitochondria and that the DNA of mitochondria is normally maternally inherited. We could also talk about mitochondrial diseases. But today, we're talking about ATP, ATP synthase. So ATP synthase. Um, Let's dive into Dr. Paul Boyer's lecture. Um, he spoke about how it's a key player in the processes. Um, ATP is a key player in the processes. And the abbreviation for ATP, abbreviation of ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. So adenosine triphosphate, if we break it down, it is made up of the adenine base, which is a double ring um, functionality, and it's bonded to the ribose sugar or the oxyribose sugar and then you also have the phosphate so it has adenosine triphosphate has three phosphates so he then he goes on to discuss how when he was a graduate student fritz lipman big name recognized the broad role atp played in biological energy capture and use the adenosine portion for our purposes can be regarded as paul boy speaking can be regarded as a convenient handle to bind the ATP to enzymes. It has three phosphate groups attached in a row, particularly the last two that participate in energy capture. And we normally see that as the pyrophosphate. When the energy stored in ATP is used, the terminal and hydride bond is split, forming adenosine diphosphate and inorganic phosphate. The resynthesis of ATP coupled to energy input, this is a key idea, is catalyzed by an enzyme called ATP synthase present in abundance in intracellular membranes of animal mitochondria, such as humans, such as in humans, plant, chloroplasts, bacteria, and other organisms. So these are good ideas to keep in mind. The ATP made by your ATP synthase 
is transported out of the mitochondria and used for the function of muscles, brains, and other tissues and organs. Um, the ATP, ADP and phosphate form when ATP is used um, is returned to the mitochondria and ATP is made again using the energy from oxidations. So let's continue on. Um, so this process is ubiquitous uh, for the most part. Um, all living cells contain hundreds of large specialized protein molecules called enzymes. So enzymes are globular proteins. Enzymes are very important in the body. They help to catalyze thermodynamic unfavorable processes. They serve as biological catalysts in which they reduce the E of A or the activation energy or provide an alternative pathway um, for the reaction to occur. Um, enzymes are very important in the body, whether it be in processes such as respiration, digestion, a lot of biological processes are run with the machinery of which you consider to be enzymes and catalyze hundreds of reactions. So the important and very difficult question that remained unanswered, and Paul Boyer spoke of this for many years, was how the ATP synthase uses the proton motor force to make ATP. Um, so as he was speaking, he, sp he mentioned how um, ATP, during net ATP synthesis, synthesis, the three catalytic sites in the enzyme acting in sequence first bind ADP and phosphate, then undergo a conformational change so as to make a tightly bound ATP, and then change conformation again to release this ATP. Let's keep reading. These changes are accomplished by a striking rotational catalysis. And we'll talk more about that in a later episode driven by a rotating in the core of the enzyme. So this is coinciding with the ideas that we consider now in which ATP synthase is considered to be a molecular motor or a pump, um, which in turn is driven by the protons crossing the mitochondrial membrane. Um, you know, he mentioned how these unusual features are energy linked binding changes that include release of a tightly bound ATP sequential conformational changes of three catalytic sites to accomplish these binding changes and a rotary mechanism that drives the conformational changes. These features had not been recognized previously in enzymology. That's something similar, I would say so myself. Um, here we have a picture of the uh, layout of ATP synthase. So let's take it back a bit. In the mid 1950s, um, some 12 years after Paul Boyer received his PhD, um, some experiments on how ATP is made were conducted in his laboratory. Um, one concerned the capture of energy in glycolysis, which we know is an anaerobic, typically an anaerobic process, in which you have a, a small amount of ATP that's made. Um, glycolysis typically takes place in the cytoplasm of the cells. Glycolysis is important. Um, we go from glucose to pyruvate, passing through a variety of men enzymes. So from, let's just go through glycolysis quickly. Glycolysis in which you have glucose, so the use of hexokinase is converted to G6P or glucose 6-phosphate. Um, using phosphoglucoisomerase, we go from glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. Using phosphofructokinase, we go from fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Using aldolase, aldolase spits out um, DHAP, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, and G3P, using triose phosphate isomerase, we interconvert um, DHAP to G3P. Using GAP DH or glyceraldehyde phosphate dehydrogenase, we convert G3P to 1,3-BPG or 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Using phosphoglycerate kinase, we produce 3-phosphoglycerate. Using phosphoglucomutase, we produce 2 phosphoglycerate using enolase, which proceeds through an E1CB mechanism. We produce PEP or phosphoenol pyruvate. And using pyruvate kinase, we produce pyruvate. Pyruvate kinase then shuttles or then goes through um, pyruvate dehydrogenase to produce acetyl CoA and that feeds into the TTA cycle, in which you have oxaloacetate combining with acetyl CoA to form citrate to the enzyme citrate synthase. So that's just a recap of glycolysis and significance in aerobic respiration. So we found that, going back to the lecture, we found that the oxidation of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate could occur without the participation of inorganic phosphate. This is him noting this, suggesting participation of an acyl enzyme intermediate. 
extension of these experiments and salient findings in the Raqqa group, again, we have a big name, demonstrated that a sulfahydryl or sulfahydryl group on the enzyme was acylated and the acyl enzyme was cleaved by inorganic phosphate to form 1,3-diphosphoglycerate, which in turn transferred a phosphoryl group to ADP to make ATP. Key idea, take note of this. Demonstration that two covalent intermediates, the acyl enzyme and the phosphorylated substrate, preceded ATP formation, made it seem logical to seek for similar intermediates in oxidative phosphorylation. So established conceptual precedent led to further investigation. That's what this is saying. And as we and others learned years later, this was not a useful approach. He said it. So of more relevance to ATP synthase were experiments in which you had the isotope of oxygen, 18 oxygen, and 32 phosphate. Um, those are the radioisotopes initiated because of the demonstration by Mildred Kahn that mitochondria would catalyze a rapid exchange of phosphate oxygens with those of water, phosphate and oxygen with those of water. So we found that the phosphate experiments um, were using the overall reaction of oxidative phosphorylation was dynamically reversible, which makes sense. Um, it was some 16 years later that we found that the simple explanation that no intermediate was formed and that rapid exchange resulted from the rapid and reversible formation of a tightly bound ATP. So moving along, let's talk about the catalytic sites. Um, Dr. Boyer further went on to say in his lecture that chemical derivatization studies such as those in Bragg's laboratory, again, we have a big name, and summarized in, in his the reviews that he referenced, showed that all three 13 subunits, although with identical amino acid sequence, had distinctly different chemical properties. That is something to take note of. We were also impressed by the studies. They were also impressed by the studies of Fitte's laboratory showing that one defective mutant 13 subunits stopped catalysis. And by related mutational studies in Singer's laboratory that favored the participation of three equivalent 13 subunits for catalysis. So the conclusion that you reach is very likely is that it's very likely that three sites participate in an equivalent manner. Subsequent events have strengthened this conclusion, um, although he said that some doubts remain, which he was not aware of at the time. The probability that three sites participate equivalently has guided experiments in his laboratory since the presence of three 13 subunits first seem likely. So he also spoke about the rotational catalysis within this enzyme. Um, some ideas to mention is that there were related experiments that took place in this laboratory with sodium potassium ATP synthase. Um, that's something to note. So what three points stood out or stand out to me? The intricacies of ATP synthase. The idea that all living cells contain enzymes, and these enzymes are very important, especially in biological reactions. And also, um, or finally, oxidative phosphorylation is important. Additionally, with ATP synthase, um, and how it proceeds with its mechanism of catalyzing the formation of ATP. So what are some implications? When it comes to disease etiology, whether it be Alzheimer's, neuro neurodegenerative diseases, or other diseases that can be uh, attributed to a mitochondrial dysfunction or mitochondrial disease, or whatever the case may be, and of course, that's to the bioenergetic paradigm. Um, whatever the case may be, ATP synthase is very important because it produces a key energy currency in the body that is used and is coupled to a lot of reaction. So it pays to understand these things. So I told you what, why we should care. It's an important enzyme in biological reactions. What three points are to me? The structure of the enzyme, the intricacies of it, um, the fact that enzymes are very important in biological reactions, and also oxidative phosphorylation, which is catalyzed which involves ATP synthase is a very important process. And what are the implications? The implications for disease etiology, disease, or, or looking at the origins of diseases. So here we have it, Paul Boyer's lecture, a summary in the eyes of a chemical biology graduate student at this time. Hopefully it helps. So if I was to address this, or if I was categorizing it, 
or breaking it down for kid. For example, um, ADP synthase is important. This enzyme or this machine or this protein is important because it produces or helps it to form or facilitate the formation of a key energy currency or a key molecule that is important in the body. So that's for the kid. For high school student, this is important because it's associated with something that we learned about known as respiration. Respiration involves how the body is able to produce energy from food. So for the graduate student, the lecture is important. It produces seminal ideas or it introduces seminal ideas that are helping us to this day and informing our work. So thanks again for listening. So once you have it, this again, you have it. This is the new chemist podcast um, in which we discuss uh, chemistry, which simply put is the science of change. And we also discuss ideas such as research, careers, COVID-19, and a variety of other ideas within the realm of science. We've had guests. This is within the Think Tank series. Of course, we reference the work of Dr. Paul Boyer, the lecture, which is, on, which is publicly available on the Nobel uh, Foundation's website. And also we reference a book that outlined the lecture and speech, the introductory speech by the Dr. Bertil Anderson. So, Professor Bertil. So thanks again for listening. Hopefully this benefited you. Hopefully it helped. Stay tuned. This is just a preamble to more that will come. Also stay tuned because this upcoming week and the weeks to come, we will have interviews by Dev Mandavia, interviews with Dev Mandavia, um, Julio Rodriguez, and Janae Burroughs, who are all leaders in their own age and stage and right. So thanks again for listening. Just to note, the views in this podcast reflect those of myself and my guests. Thanks for listening. We're glad you were able to tune into this podcast. Once again, this is The New Chemist, where we discuss chemistry, which simply put is the science of change, as well as the other sciences, careers, community, research, and COVID-19. Thanks again for listening. Note, the views on this podcast represent those of my guests and I. Thanks for listening to the podcast series, The New Student Pharmacist, where we discuss chemistry and pharmacy, as well as leaders in pharmacy careers, community, and chemistry and pharmacy research. We encourage you to support the work we are doing and follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts by subscribing for free. We are so glad that you were able to tune in today. Note, the views on the podcast represent those of my guest, and I take care and all the best.